Remember when you throw stones in the lake and it caused ripples? When I was doing this as a girl, I had no idea that this would turn out to be the analogy I would most often use to explain gravitational waves to people who are not scientists. Gravitational waves are a prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is the modern theory of gravity that replaced Newton's classical theory in the early 20th century. Einstein's theory is based on geometry. Masses induce a space-time curvature, and that curvature is responsible for attracting other masses. Now, when masses move, ripples in the space-time curvature are generated, then propagate through space. So it's a bit like those ripples on the lake, but on a much larger scale, and what vibrates is space itself. And those space-time vibrations are what we call gravitational waves, or GWs for short. And I want to tell you the story of how not seeing gravitational waves led to a groundbreaking scientific discovery. The GW sources that we detect are generated in very powerful astrophysical events, like stars colliding. And we're interested in both the waves themselves, to probe Einstein theory, and in the events that create them. And in that sense, observing GWs is a new type of astronomy. And it's a very difficult type of astronomy, because GWs are extremely elusive and hard to detect. Let's take a look at numbers to understand how big a challenge it is. When a GW reaches Earth, space is briefly distorted, distances change, and our detectors try to register that change. And the way our detectors work is they use light from a laser source that monitor the distance between suspended mirrors that are several kilometers apart. And the GW is going to change that distance of several kilometers for a short time by 10 to the minus 19 meter, which is an absolutely tiny amount. It's a billion times smaller than an atom, and it's even 10,000 times smaller than the nucleus in an atom. It is so small that it took decades to get detectors that would be sensitive enough to record such a small signal. There are three such detectors. We call them interferometers around the world. The two LIGO detectors in the US and the Virgo detector in Europe. Virgo and LIGO operate together. They form a network of detectors and a big collaboration of more than a thousand people. And we started building LIGO and Virgo 25 years ago or so, and we have kept improving them to make them more and more sensitive until finally, on September 14, 2015, the first gravitational wave signal was detected by the two LIGO detectors. So Virgo was not operating at the time, but it was a milestone for the collaboration, and it was just amazing to see that first beautiful signal received from a fascinating source colliding black holes more than a billion light years away. So it, it took a long time before GWs were detected and you know what they say that the path is the goal and well it has to be the case when you walk the path for so long before getting any real results. It certainly helps that you don't walk the path alone. Collaborative work is a great way to sustain motivation and progress in the long run. It probably also helps that you don't know beforehand that the path is going to be so long. When I joined the effort in 1993, I was aware that detecting the first gravitational waves would take some years, maybe even, I don't know, may maybe 10 years. I didn't anticipate that having children and raising them would almost start looking like a short-term project in comparison. Now let's get back to our GW sources. There were a few detected since September 2015, most of them from colliding black holes. 
Those black holes are what remains of massive stars once they have exhausted the fuel that keeps them shining and they collapse under their own weight. Gravity is so strong around black holes that nothing can escape, not even light, and that's why they are black. And when two black holes spiral toward each other, GWs are emitted, which drives the black holes closer together, emitting stronger and stronger GWs until the black holes collide and merge. And those binary black hole mergers, as we call them, they occur randomly, and we have detected a handful so far. And we name them after the date when the signal was recorded, so GW150914 for the very first one on September 14, 2015. Now, of the six black hole mergers reported so far, there is one that is very special to us, namely GW170814. So it's a very recent one. It was detected three months ago on August 14. And on that day, not only were the two LIGO detectors operating, but Virgo was too. And it was the first signal seen in three detectors, the first one ever detected by Virgo. Yeah. Now, why does it matter so much that a signal is seen by three detectors? The reason is that it's the only way that we can locate the source in the sky with some precision. A single GW detector cannot tell where a signal came from because the detector sees most of the sky. Um, it's most sensitive to signals that come from directly above or beneath the detector, uh, and there are some blind directions, you have to keep this in mind, but the detector sees most of the sky at any given time. So it's not like a telescope that you have to point to a particular direction. It's more like one of our ears, which can hear sound no matter where it comes from, with the consequence that it's kind of hard to tell where sound is coming from. Now, speaking of sound, have you ever heard the sound of GWs? Let's try to hear one. Now, because we have two ears and a brain that is able to compare the sounds received by each of our ears, we can get some sense of where sound is coming from. And we do just the same with GW detectors. By comparing the signals received in several detectors, we can nail the source position in the sky. Now, with two detectors, the localization is very crude. But a third detector is a game changer. It really narrows the position to a small area. And that's why it was so important that LIGO and Virgo work together and why it was so great to make a triple detection. So after GW170814, we had three days to celebrate and recover until another signal came that was even more extraordinary. GW170817 came on August 17, and the first remarkable fact about it is that it is from a different type of source. Instead of black holes colliding, it was neutron stars colliding. A neutron star is also the remnant of an extinct massive star, but one that was not quite massive enough to collapse to a black hole. And the other remarkable thing is when neutron stars collide, you expect a very powerful blast to follow. A blast that you can hope to see with telescopes, provided that you can point the telescopes quickly enough to the right direction in the sky, because the light from the blast is dim and it fades away rapidly. Now, on that day, our three detectors were operating, so we were well equipped to localize the source and ask our astronomer colleagues to move into action. Trouble was, the signal was quite loud in the two LIGO detectors, but there was no signal to speak of in Virgo. No signal big enough to be identified as a signal. Hmm. Well, sobering as this was, it turned out to be very valuable information because it could only mean one thing, that the source was close to one of those directions that the Virgo detector was blind to at that time. And that information was key to pinpoint 
a small area in the sky where the source had to be and ask astronomers to target that area. And they did in the night that followed. And sure enough, for the first time, they were able to witness the explosion that followed the neutron star merger and the gravitational wave signal. And the amount of data and insight that was collected on and from this one event is just incredible. One of the things that we learned is that GWs do propagate through space at the speed of light, just as Einstein had predicted. How could we check that? Well, the first light from the merger reached us 1.7 seconds after the GW signal, which means that gravitational waves and light, after traveling for 130 million years, arrived to us within two seconds, which is pretty good uh, synchronicity. So this was the story of uh, how uh, by essentially not hearing GW170817, Virgo allowed to locate the source in the sky so precisely that telescopes could rush there and witness the explosion that followed. And gather an incredible amount of information and a discovery that was the first multi-messenger one, so a new type of event observed with both gravitational waves and light. And I'd like to close by suggesting that you ponder the various time scales that are involved in this story. So a century between Einstein's prediction and GW detection, a lifetime to build sensitive detectors, 130 million years from the source to the Earth, and a delay of 1.7 seconds between gravitational waves and light upon arrival. Thank you.